Alright lads, welcome back to Hearts of Iron 4, the new order as Konstantin Vladimirovich Radzevsky, the Vajd of all Russians in the all-Russian government of Amur. Last episode we had our introductory reading and lore video, this episode we shall be getting stuck straight into the content. Now, off we go. Alright, let's get our pitiful little, I was going to call it an army, our pitiful little militia. How many men is it? 14,000. Bruh. Field, let's get them under Field Marshal Leva Cotton and uh, General Georgi Shekarev. Let's get our research um, departments doing some researching some AK 47s and some D 20 152 millimeter howitzers. Very nice. Let's get the true air of carbon focus going. Let's get our one, our singular military factory producing basic infantry rifles, not even a rifle, submachine gun. And let's get our single civilian factory building infrastructure. How long would that take? That would take 7,976 days to get the maximum infrastructure. Bloody hell. Oh, we even have dockyards. Wow. I'm, I'm impressed. Get them building convoys. We'll probably end up cancelling that if it means saving our resources. Now. The True Air of Harbin. Plus 50 political power and plus 5% base war support. We only read that um, in the last episode. If we have time, we'll read it again, but I imagine we'll have some introductory episodes, or not introductory episodes, um, introductory events that we'll need to be reading. Ooh, our literacy and industrial expertise is decreasing, that's bad. Yeah. Also, let's get on the border with Alden. We're gonna get some events, introducing the characters. Radzevsky, Akatin, Sekarev, Balatov, um, Prishkovich. Oh, Prishkovich isn't here, it's Spasovsky. Huh, interesting. Um, basically, I'm planning a series in the future with, um, with Vladimir Prishkovich in uh, Kaiser Redux, and I actually thought that, um, that Priskovich was in this game as well, in the New Order, but no, it's Basovsky. Because I, I saw the Black Hundreds thing and I thought, oh yeah, you know, Priskovich is in um, Black Hundreds as well. But no, it's Basovsky, not Priskovich. Interesting, interesting. Now, the Steadfast Secretary lets scavenge for loot as well. There we are. For most people in Amur, being in an RFP interrogation facility would be a surefire death sentence for Leva Cotton, Secretary of the RFP and right-hand man of the Vojd. It was just another day of the week. Screams rang out in the dimly lit facility, which a cotton was touring as part of his official duties. But for a place like this, you learn to make the cries for help um, into background noise. Oliver Murr had. Just once he glanced into a chamber and saw a broken man pleading in a hoarse voice for help. Without a second thought, a cotton turned away and left him to his fate. Uh, whatever the man had been through, he undoubtedly deserved it. After all, the Vosh willed it. A cotton knew that there was a great moral good to aiding Rodzevsky's cause in spite of the seemingly gruesome nature of it, such as the crushing the Bolsheviks that had driven them all out of their homes and the small hat people um, that had guided the, that disastrous revolution. In any case, it seemed that Rodzevsky was doing the right thing because he placed. Uh, let's do that. Because he. What can we do here? Uh, invest in infrastructure, focus on research, political campaign, secure control. And we'll do, concert, we'll do uh, secure control. Yeah. No, there we go. We'll do it. There we are. Now. Um, because he placed trust in his Vosge just as he trusted him, this was the foundation of their friendship, a bond forged through a mutual hatred of the subhumans during the days in Harbin, and strong enough to resist any attempt any attempt by lesser men to poison it. Now we can uh, deselect all of that, actually. Except secure control. Now. There we are. Uh, Although Cotton thought as yet another pain to scream fill the air, that last part might not be true anymore. With what Bolotov was capable of and willing to do, he feared the day his own name would be included among those uh, that the torturer whispered to Radzevsky, feeding the paranoia of the Vosh that a Cotton believed in even now. That belief was all he really had. It'll do. Contact. Oh, never mind. The Vosh. I love how we get the event for a Cotton before we get the event for Radzevsky. The Vajd of the Russians. A cold eastern wind rattled the shutters of, Vajd, of the Vajd's office window, whistling as it slipped between the thin wooden slats. Rodzevsky. 
Rodzewski, uh, Rodzewski shivered and drew the heavy greatcoat close around his shoulders, closing the fur uh, lining around his neck to try and keep the warmth in. Only his face and hands were exposed to the chilly air of his makeshift headquarters, intense eyes tracing across the page before him as his numb fingers scrawled out a new addition to the manifesto of Russian Hackenkreutzism. The ancient clock on the wall chimed a single peal, signifying that one o'clock in the morning had come as he reached the bottom of the page and downed his pen. It was the third night in a row that Rodzevsky had stayed up late to continue work on his magnum opus. He thought it was a um, complete long, uh, long ago, but the sudden collapse of Red Authority and the mockery of Russia it maintained had changed the situation. Without the aid of the Japanese, he had gone from Harbin to Dissenzea on the River Murr in just a few short days. In that short period of time, just a few prior, just a few years prior, the fortunes of the Russian um, bundle of six party had changed completely. Uh, that hadn't lasted long, of course. The thought of Matkovsky's betrayal and the split of the RFP stoked the fire of hate in the Vaj's gut, and he reached for the flask of vodka beside him to quench it. The taste of vile and stomach turning as the betrayal did little to soothe his temper, but he ignored it and took another deep swig. It would do its job eventually, and that it was just like the assorted rabble that his stateless called an army. Oh my god! Hedrick was named successor! Wow. That's, um, that's rare. B though not as rare as Goring, or not Goring, but a Spear being named successor. I think I've seen Spear be named successor twice, and I've seen Hedrick be named successor three times, so, yeah. Hedrick is also the canon's uh, successor, though not the canon winner of the uh, German Civil War. That'd be Borman, naturally. Um, that his stateless called an army, crude, ill-formed, hammered out of whatever was lying around to make something functional, but it was his, it was Russia's, for only here was Russia to be found, beyond the Murr's borders, there lay only traitors, subhumans, and dreads, their collective boot on the throat of the Russian people. Someday he would have his chance, someday as the vodka saw him through one hard day after another, the RFP would see Russia through this trial, someday. Now, the last hundred, is that eight days? I think so. In his small office in Zaya, Mikhail Spasovsky took his cigarette out of his mouth and let a and let a breath filled and let out a breath filled with smoke. He was getting old. There was no denying that. That didn't mean he was about to refuse himself the last comforts available to him. With a sigh, he turned his attention to the paperwork in front of him. It was all meaningless messages to and from the Japanese, the only real allies remaining to the government in Amur. It was Spasovsky's job to make sure they remained friendly to Rodzevsky's. <laughs> Magadan wants to invade us. Or not invade us, rather, but uh, they want our loot. Well, you can't have it. Let's get on the border. Now, uh, what was I? It was Spasovsky's job to make sure they remained friendly to Rodzevsky's aims, which usually meant agreeing with everything they said and signing where they wanted him to sign. None of them were really in a position to bargain with Japan, after all. Spasovsky thought back to his youth, when everything had seemed had seemed hopeful for the cause, when the Black Hundreds had been strong and he had been a member. Now their vision for Russia seemed like a distant dream, with small hat people and Reds running loose all over Russia and spreading their filth. He hated um, all of them for that without question. However, uh, he was not uh, he was now not only old but incredibly tired. There wasn't enough energy left in him to really care what happened, especially since he had a feeling that he wouldn't live to enjoy it. Deciding that he needed to focus just a little more, he put out the cigarette and picked up his pen, returning to his endless work on the foreign affairs of the RFP, though he might never see it happen. He would at least try to help Rodzevsky one day make the small hat people and the Reds pay for, the, the, for their disgusting ex existences the very day he died, and from hell he would laugh. Good for him, because he will be dead by the end of the game. Now, the snake. Alexander Bolotov rose with the sun. He always had and he always would continue to do so. It was a habit he had gotten into during his youth and he stuck to it as he rose from bed. The first thing that the all-Russian government's security minister noticed was his pounding headache. Typically, he muttered, to, he muttered to himself as he swung his legs onto the chilly wooden floor and sat up. He recalled that his briefings were expected by the Vajd this morning. Is that new? That's definitely new. Now... Uh, Slipping on his clothes, trimming his beard, and preparing for his day, Bolotov only had one uh, thing in mind. As he finished his modest breakfast, consumed out of habit, um, not hunger, he went back to his bedroom. What's this about? Ah, uh, yes, improve relations with the Japanese. Please do. Oh, there we are. Uh, 
he went back to his bedroom and from under a false bottom in his dresser, he pulled out an ornate wooden box. Once Owen Baltov stared at the nondescript serrets with a lustful stare of morphine, he carefully rolled up his sleeve after sitting on his bed and selected a serrette. Unsheathing its needle, he picked up... What's this about? Ah, yes. New, uh... We need to get rid of our, our malice as far so let's focus on academic base and industrial expertise. Build new schools. Now, unsheathing its needle, he picked up the phone he kept on his nightstand and dialed Vladimir um, Golubsov, one of his many scions. As the line rang through, Bolotov jammed the serrette into his arm. Almost immediately, his headache began to recede and his muddled brain fog began to clear. Sighing blissfully, his moment of tranquility was interrupted by Golubsov's gruff voice on the other end. After cursory greetings, Bolotov asked about his informants. We're still working on them pretty hard, boss, um, Golubsov reported, but don't worry, we'll get them talking. Bolotov, satisfied, reminded him that he needed the documents implicating another half-dozen party members at his office before he got there, and Golubsov assured him that they were already there. After a sinister don't-make-me-come-looking, he placed the phone back on the receiver, unrolled his sleeve and went to leave. As he reached the, his front door, he stuffed himself into his warm jacket and felt the cold metal of the pistol he always kept with him. He planned to use that gun today. Now... Ultimatum. I think we're as ready as we can be. Yeah. We will not back down so easily. Hopefully it is where I hope it will be. Yeah, it is fantastic, fantastic. Now, which one is next? I can read it. Um, either one. Let's let's keep going with the characters. The Determined. Georgi Shekarev checked the time on his watch. We should be. We should win that, yeah. Um, quarter to nine in the morning. Time enough for the leader of the Black Church, the Russian... Fa ooh, the Russian... Um, Bundle of Sticks Party's paramilitary wing to make his way to party headquarters for his meetings. Sitting at his desk, he pulled out two small leather-bound books, one black, one brown. Opening the cracked spine of the black book, he looked at his appointments for the day to be sure that he wouldn't miss any. As he looked well into the afternoon, uh, he grimaced a conference with Security Minister Alexander Bolotov and the Vosged himself. The Vosged he could handle despite his leader's seemingly ever-increasing paranoia. It was Bolotov that he couldn't stomach. With their lunge into Russia proper following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the RFB had a shot at forming a legitimate state to abandon the thuggery and uh, mafia-like tactics which had defined their stay in the city of Harbin. It wasn't the violence Shekharev disliked, it was a seemingly mindless character that, that was associated with Bolotov's unique brand, and as if he and those in his employ were rabid dogs. Bolotov apparently had no intention to ever depart from his ways despite Shekharev's continued urgings. If Shekharev wasn't integral and a good friend of the Vosh, he was sure that he would have been shot by the morphine addict long ago. Closing the black book and opening the brown, he looked through his journal, meticulously um, kept ever since the early days of his involvement with the party. He remembered his failed career as a teacher and a tinge of yearning for the days of Harbin. Looking at the failed, at the faded pages, he, the leader of the Black Shirts resolved that he would serve uh, faithfully in his post, both officially for the Black Shirts and, officially, and unofficially as a force for civilizing, for civilizing the party he loved, humanizing the Vajd. Why? Um, it's kind of, it's kind of, I think, um, Shekharev would nearly be better as a party secretary rather than a cotton. A cotton is kind of like the leader of the army. It's difficult to be both. Get that. Yeah, nice. Now, the matter of Blagovshensk. Blagovshensk is a town of little worth and with and even less significance. At least that's how the Japanese see it, renaming it to, uh, Halan Pau. Is it Halan Pau? Let me check. I think it's Halan Pau. Yeah, Halan Pau. When it was annexed to their miserable puppet kingdom of Manchukuo, as they did uh, when they stole the great eastern jewel of Vladivostok, the Rodzevsky, however it means the world, for it is the Vosges' hometown. It is therefore also the birthplace of the RFP and Russian Hackenkreuzism, and once we hold the entirety of Russia, it will be the birthplace of the nation itself. As any good nationalist knows, having one's home occupied by foreign invaders is an unacceptable state of affairs and does severe harm to the morale of the people. Just as, as the Tsars would have fought tooth and nail for St. Petersburg, we must have Blagovshensk. Thankfully, since neither the Japanese nor their Manchu servants have any real interest in the town, they are unlikely to have any good reason for turning down the Vosges' righteous demand for our sovereign territory. They will lose a troublesome population and gain our eternal gratitude with the addition of some reasonable concessions to their greedy industrialists, uh, no doubt. I'm sure they'll agree. Dai Nippon Taikoku gets event an unusual request. Now, contact the Japanese. In the darkest years of red tyranny, the conscientious and patriotic exiles of Harbin could not ask for a better ally than the, than the magnificent Empire of Nippon, a state which did not know the Jew, the small hat influence for millennia. It rose as the preeminent power of free Asia that rejected the values of the mercantile and uh, small hat civilization and cherished honor and tradition. The moral virtues of the Japanese are truly the, the opposite to those of the small hat people. 
The Japanese establishment was not blinded to the threat coming from the Soviet Empire and was fully aware of the role of which the RFP was to play in the anti-Red Crusade. It was the Empire of the Rising Sun that directed our efforts towards the recapture of Priyamur and aided our forces with guns and butter against the Red Armies. Even though Japan withdrew from Russian affairs, it doesn't mean the Empire can no longer assist in our struggle. By any means, the Vosges will show himself as a worthy ally to the Chrysanthemum throne and prove his willingness to continue our relations on good terms. Now, the Free All-Russian Army gains the national spirits of Abadnaya Ruskaya Armia, which grants division organization plus 5%, recruitment population plus, uh, plus 3%, and division attack plus 5%. Are we winning that? We are. You need to get there, though. You're taking your damn time. The warriors of the Russian Bundle of Sticks party are full of fervor and courage, yet they lack in, um, yet they lack in training and discipline necessary for an army of the modern age. Our forces, primarily composed of um, street fighters and militiamen of Harbin, are hardly a match um, to our closest rivals that have the brightest officers of the white cliques or at least American mercenaries at their disposal. What else to say about the Reds who fasten their soldiery with a fierce drill and don't shun any inhumane measures to achieve their pitiable victories? If the restoration of Russia is ought to happen and let it come to happen, the reform of the all-Russian army should become our foremost priority. No. Why can't I do that? Oh, right, we have to get the Black of Sense back first. Now. Um... The reform of the All-Russian Army should become our foremost priority. Our military minds will adopt the experience of Japanese and the White Army elders. Our recruits will be bound by the will of the party and the military will become an organic entity, not to be disturbed by internal squabbles. Perhaps one day the world will watch with amazement how a few small band of followers would become a force to equal the mighty Wehrmacht. Fantastic. Hey, we're winning. Good, good, good. Gonna get Black Vashensk? I'm gonna make me wait for it. Alright, I think we'll uh, go down this then. Yeah. <coughs> no, we'll go down here. God Nation Labour. Plus 50 political power, gain base ability plus 7.5%. God Nation Labour with this slogan, the Russian fascist. Ooh, the Russian. Um, I'll call it the Black Party, yeah. The Russian Black Party made itself known when it was first formed by the visionary members of the white emigres in Harbin. In those words lies power and strength of Russian. Uh, yeah, bundle of sticks kind of works for that. A Russian bundle of sticksism as a construct for as a constructive force. Wait, I've read that. Yeah, I've read that before. Yeah. The enemy is defeated. Fantastic. An American on the border, that's just Steve. Arrest them, they are to be interrogated. Oh, do we kill him? Goodbye, Steve. Japan accepts our offer. Very good. Joyous day, glorious happy day, a uh, glorious happy day. The Japanese, ever our stalwart ally against threads and their servants, have agreed to cede Black of Sense to our all Russian government. It's been little over a year since we first heard confirmation that the Japanese Diet would review our request, and the way it has finally paid off. This morning, a one man Japanese delegation arrived by plane to formally hand over the territory, with the Vosges putting a signature to the agreement in his Zaya headquarters. In return for ceding Black of Sense, we have granted the Japanese special rights to some of the natural resources in far eastern Siberia. Once we secure those resources and unite the region under a stable government, the resultant trade and mining deals will no doubt prove extremely fruitful for our reborn Russian state. For now, the Vosges has publicly confirmed that he will travel to his hometown post-haste for a grand celebration now that is officially now that it is officially back in Russian hands. Doubtless, the people will be overjoyed to live under our enlightened Hakenkreutz rule rather than the uncaring and distant Manchus. Today, Blagovashensk. Tomorrow, Moscow. Nice. Become owner and controller of Jaya. We shall bump our core population up to almost close to a million. Now, rapturous, rapturous joy filled the streets of Blagovashensk uh, Blag today. When Radzevsky arrived, the populace, encouraged by black shirts who handed out Hakenkreutz flags and portraits of the Vajd, 
turned out in their hundreds to, uh, to cheer our uh, to cheer on our glorious leaders' procession as they marched through the chilly morning air to the town hall. There, the mayor or the mayor granted the granted the vojd the keys of the city and led the crowd in a rousing rendition of farewell of Slavyanka. The crowd was um yeah just, yeah we'll get the purge first and hopefully we'll be rid of it by the time um. Matkovsky and Mikhail come knocking. Now, the Vaj was visibly overjoyed to be back in his hometown. Tears freezing on his cheeks as he addressed the enthralled crowd and the armed black shirts keeping guard. This is a day that we that will live on in the history of our great nation. He stated, today we have reclaimed the very heart of the all-Russian government. For it was here that I, Vaj, of the Russians, entered the world. Here, over 50 years ago, the divine destiny of Russia began to unfold. Here, holy Russia saw the genesis of its rebirth. Glory to Russia. The Vaj had one further honor to bestow upon the town. Henceforth, by Vaj, by Vaj's decree, it shall bear his own name in, per in perpetuity. Blagovshensk is dead. It, it, blah. Blagovshensk is dead. Long live the noble people of Rodzievsk. Welcome to Rodzievsk. Gains corn Blagovshensk. Blagovshensk changed his name to Rodzievsk and renamed Rodzievsk. Fantastic. Close to a million over, only 7,000 away from 1 million. It'll do. Hmm, our army is actually well, relatively well equipped now. 93%. Fantastic. Radzevsky's part. Actually, no, we need to read the other one first. God Nation Labour. Oh, no, I did read that. Then, yeah, I read that. That's fine. Radzevsky's part. No, the time has come for the Vaj to clean house. It's no secret that the Russian fascist. The Russian. Um, bundle of Sticks party. And by extension, it's head. Radzevsky have witnessed. I've read that as well. Yeah, I've read that as well. <laughs> I've read all of them. <laughs> Grand job. We have a nice amount of political power. Very nice. Yeah, let's read about Lev. Lev Pavlovich Cotton was born and raised in Chita, a city now under the incompetent administration of the Tsarist Splitters. In 1920, at the age of nine, Akotin and his family, staunch Tsarists, fled the city for Harbin, fearing retribution from oncoming Soviet forces. Growing up as a boy in exile with an unhappy home life, Akotin was a natural and youthful recruit into Rodzevsky's newly formed Russian uh, Bundle of Sticks party, one of the first members of the organization joining in 1932 and leaving his job at the Harbin Teachers Institute shortly after. Oh, excuse me, Akotin would quickly become one of the Vaj's few friends. A good listener, natural confidant. He rose through the ranks of the of the RP until he was um, Rodzevsky's number two. All right, we'll come back to him. Of um, one bundle of sticks, people and kittens. Go on, Roz Rodzevsky said to the tiny figure of a kitten before him. Drink in front of it was a bowl filled with warmed milk. As his fingers touched its head, it hissed. Fierce kitten. When Rodzevsky found him on the street of his new domain, it scratched its face. His face, maybe. No man would dare to would dare mess with the little kitten. He thought brave and courageous in the face of absolute danger. Its coat was a patchy and a rough crisscross of monochrome, but its eyes were bright golden. Dis uh, were bright golden discs. God's gifts. Uh, God's gift to the Vajd of Russians. What's this about? Prove relations with Japanese. Yeah, do that. Now, clean house. Um. An aide entered. Rodzevsky did not even notice the footsteps. Russia could wait. The world could wait. The small hat people could wait. And what's this? Scavenge from all over. Yeah, fantastic. Um, the party, Matkovsky, Mikhail, none of it mattered. The kittens' hisses and snorts mattered. <laughs> snorts mattered more than the aide's report. Its little tongue lapping the white rich richness in front of it soothed Constantine's heart more than anything else. The feel of its fur, coarse and dirty, dusty and grimy, did not repulse nor frighten him. At his touch, it was a new life, unsullied and unsoiled by the machination of the world hostile to his ideas. Sir, the aide said, are you quite all right? Yes, moreover, what are you doing here? Get out of here, Rodzevsky thought he was a numb to send anyone to the firing line. Nice giddy, sir. Um, no shit. Have you thought of a name for it yet, sir? The question troubled Rodzevsky. He, he had not given it a thought. What would be a good name for a bold kitten such as this one? Mora, he's Mora. Now get out. The aide promptly exited the room and left Rodzevsky alone with his new friend, his new companion through the decades to come. Even the Vajd has a heart. Indeed. In <laughs> base ability plus 1%. Aww. Now the paranoid Vajd. Konstantin Rodzevsky, Vajd of all Russian, and the true leader of the Russian fa uh, the Russian Bundle of Sticks party, drifted into his office in his traditional pseudo-military garb. Removing his hat, he set it down on his archaic oaken desk and ran a hand through his grizzled hair. Another sleepless night, he grumbled to himself as he sat himself in his chair, sighing as he did so. 
Reports of troop movements, suspected traitors and production quotas have already been neatly placed on his desk, likely by some orderly or assistant whose name he couldn't be bothered to remember. They were all signed by his confidant, Bolotov, who had become one of his closest allies in the past decade. He didn't even bother with any of the reports, excepting, uh, except those regarding suspected traitors. O opening the portfolio marked Internal Descent, Radzevsky reviewed some of the names, muttering to himself, um, Bogachev, uh, Bogach uh, Tikachev, Tikachev. His eyebrows raised at the third name he read, Rizov. Mikhail Rizov had been an extremely loyal senior uh, party official in Zaya, and Rodzevsky had known him personally for a number of years, but it sort of made sense about a year back. He'd made a joke about the party's financial infrastructure in Zaya, and, Bol and Bolotov had produced some fairly convincing evidence that linked him to the long gone Zaya banker. Uh, Berezhnov, who had attempted to hide his um, small hat people ancestry, the Voz grimaced, replacing Rizov would be a pain, but if he had been fraternizing with Berezhnov, what other company had he been keeping? He picked up the phone on his desk and dialed his trusted security minister. I've seen the new lists. Move on, Rizov. Move on them all. Oh, the truth was that Rizov was innocent. The only contact he ever had with, with um, Beres... Or is it Beres Nov? No, it's Beres Noy. It was when he verbally assaulted him for his um, small people, small hat people ancestry. The Vaj's paranoia had clouded his judgment, but as long as Bolotov kept producing traitors, Radzevsky's paranoia would be sated ever since the renegades split the party and the United Front fell apart. The old Russian state was dominated by the Vaj's suspicions. The cloud darkens. Now, a new Supreme Council. Um, gains purging the Supreme Council, which grants daily political power gain plus 0 0.5. Division organization minus 20%. Division recovery rate minus 10%. Stability minus 15%. Max planning minus 15% for 365 days. Alright, a full year. And nobody is above um, Bundle of Sticks law. What's that? That's research being concluded, yeah. I'll take that. I'll get cracking into this stuff. Make sure we get all the stuff ready. Like artillery. Nice. Um, and the high members of the Supreme Council of the Russian Bundle of Sticks Party are not an exemption. Although the council is supposed to represent the most active and devoted members of the party, from the very beginning it was filled with careerists and traitors who cared about nothing but their welfare. It would be foolish to assume that these kinds of people disappeared with Makhovsky, as the marks of treachery are evident in every aspect of life in the state. Every single instance of disinformation... Corruption and disobedience, even at the lowest levels, could be linked to the highest body of the all-Russian government, with the same names constantly re reappearing on the um, Blackshire papers that are gathered on, that are gathered on Radzevsky's desk. The Vojd always looked with suspicion towards his closest associates, and now he wills to issue his judgment towards every single one of them to ele to evaluate the degree of their treachery. Some are indeed faithful followers of um, Bundle of Sticksism, but more of them have baggage to hide from the eyes of the Blackshirts. Purge of the Supreme Council. Now we can raid Alden. Fantastic. Raid them. Raid them all. The Supreme Council met uh, once a day, usually in the mornings, seven days a week in the capital of the all-Russian government. The building they met in, a converted hotel, was made to look much grander than it really was. A giant, glow uh, giant glowing Hackenkreutz, akin to the one that Radzevsky had installed in the RFP building in, Man in Manjuli, decades ago had been placed on top of the old hotel. Ostensibly, the Supreme Council was a body of government that would determine laws, enforce ordinances, and help guide the Vojd in his quest to reunite Russia. However, to any independent observer, it would seem closer to a king in his court than a council of equals. Truthfully, the Supreme Council wielded little power. Uh, most members were the oldest thugs in the RFP, back when it was an exiled movement in Tarbin, and for the most part, none of them dared challenge the policies of the Vojd, especially in his current volatile moods. Thus, the Supreme Council was more of Radzevsky's equi-chamber than an actually functioning arm of the government. Um, wait, did Boryatia just defeat Irkutsk? No, good, good, good. We can initiate that raid, do it. Um, that being said, it didn't prevent the paranoid Vaj from thinking that there were dissenters, even among his oldest, most trusted advisors. So when the council met this morning, Radzevsky, Boltov, and the Cotton stood at the end of the conference room and watched as one in every three council members were forced out of their seats by black shirts and arrested for anti-Russian activities. In the coming days, all of... Oh, nice, we forgot the loot. Does that mean we can upgrade again? Get new workers. Now... In the coming days, all of those arrested would be publicly trialed and hung. 
Their name is stricken from the party registry and their memory and their memory buried. Finally, Rodzevsky would mention to Baltov, we've secured the highest echelons of our party's leadership. The, the security minister tacitly agreed, of course, my Vajd, they were plotting. I'm glad we're rid of them. Even Baltov had begun to doubt the extent of his purges and how long before Rodzevsky oh, excuse me, turned on him. The dissenters won't liquidate themselves. No, they won't. The Rodzevsky Military Academy, army experience plus 15. Our army professionalism, societal development will, be will begin to slowly improve. The politically conscious white officers and the anti and the anti red fighters who exceeded in the Japanese ways of war proved to be a great aid in our reconquest of Amur. But as the core of the military, they aren't uh, they alone aren't a force to rely on in the long term. The demands of the ever escalating war require us to nurture military traditions of our own, to supply our formations with officer corps and provide it with professionals who embrace the experience accumulated by the greatest military minds of our age. We need to learn the to forge military cadres through every possible means. Thus, the Rodzevsk Military Academy will function as the first war school of the new Russia. The Vaj himself will be present in his hometown at the opening of the academy to greet recruits and announce his hopes and aspirations for the new generation of Russian officers who will bring glory to the um, bundle of sticks sword. Very nice. Oh, so we're right, Zach got signed. We may be seeing uh, Wallace this game. Old friends. Volotov checked his watch nervously. It read 1.13 a.m. Rumor had it that Rodzievsky was, was typically up at this time, but rarely convened his advisors for any governmental needs. But why has he called me in? Volotov asked himself as he hurried to the Vojd's residence. Had he finally outlived his usefulness? When Volotov let himself into Rodzievsky's study, he found the Vojd with a bottle of vodka and a series of documents on his desk. Volotov had recognized them immediately. They were the ones that he had given the Vojd that evening prior. He'd snuck in with the rest of his report to Dossier about the activities of Levikotin, Rodzievsky's long-time second-in-command, embezzlements and bribery uh, were the charges levelled against him. Now let's uh, quickly get this. What do we get? Yes, a new Assassin's Brigade. Very nice. Um, and, a faintly, and a faintly traceable path of the money was included in the Dossier. As Bolotov let himself in, Rodzievsky didn't even greet him. Is this true? He asked. The tone of his voice evidenced his exhaustion, but the look in his eyes showed betrayal. But more than that, bloodshotting with bags. The rumours were true. The Vaj was an insomniac. Bolotov didn't even try to feign ignorance. It's what the evidence shows, my Vaj. I couldn't believe it myself. Lev's been sealing from the party, well, for years, maybe. There was a pause. And what of the bribery? Can we look into those who took the money a cotton offered? Rodzievsky asked. The security minister grimaced. Um, oh, I was going to say, what the hell? Um, unfortunately, not my Vaj. You see the names there. Uh, Kavasov and Bogachev, Bogachev, both executed for treason the latter uh, last week. It seems we like we caught them first. There was a second prolonged silence. Boltov awkwardly standing in front of Radzevsky's desk. Radzevsky lethargically waved his hand, dismissed. As Boltov saw himself out, the Vaj's minds, or ma the Vaj's mind raced. Could a cotton have hidden this for so long? How could he have done this? Or was this just a play by Boltov to remove competition? It's time to go to bed. A cotton would never do this. I don't know why you would ever choose to kill a cotton. He's your first field marshal. Like you know. It's really obvious what Bolotov is doing. It's time to go to bed. A cotton would never do this. Gain base stability plus 5%. Political power plus 25. This is kind of more decision for the New Order too when Bolotov can kind of... I imagine Bolotov can either kill Rodzevsky or succeed him when Rodzevsky dies at the end of the New Order too. Because Rodzevsky pretty young, but he's like... And he gets rid of the alcohol. So I'd say Rodzevsky towards the end of, new, of uh, the New Order too will just kind of... Um, how shall we say? Like the years are catching up with him. He'll appoint a successor. I imagine it'll either be a cotton... Uh, Shekarev or Bolotov. Now, here we are. Gain base ability plus 5% and 25 physical power. Lovely. Graduation day. I swear by God this holy oath that I un offer unconditional obedience to the, to the Vajd of the Russian nation and people, Konstantin Radzievsky, the commander-in-chief of the All-Russian Army, and that I am prepared as a brave soldier to risk, my life, to risk my life for this oath at any time. Anton finished his Pledge of Allegiance with gusto, puffing out his chest as he thumped his right fist against his chest and then threw it outwards and upwards to his assembled comrades. Glory to Russia, he shouted voice clear in the chilly air of the lecture theatre. Glory to Russia came the roaring united refrain from the cadets as they too saluted the army's newest lieutenant. Glory to Russia barked Major Corbett, who also took his turn to salute, before stepping in front of Anton, producing a lieutenant's bar fashioned from brass and pinning it to his breast. Lieutenant Anton Mikhailovich Melnikov, you are henceforth... Okay, so, like, obviously, these names are Russian, but we, like, we've just seen two Metro references in the same event. Corbett is in Metro, and Melnikov is Miller. So, uh, yeah, it, I mean, it has to be one. You are henceforth an officer of the All-Russian Army. You now represent all that is best in the Russian race. You will not fail, you will not falter, you will not give a single step to the enemy. You will uphold the glory of the Vajd and the All-Russian government against the small hat people Red Menace and its puppets, wherever they might be found, do you understand? 
Anton saluted again, stretching out his arms so far, so far and fast that he felt something pop in his elbow. Yes, sir, glory to Russia. Corbett nodded approvingly, and Anton allowed himself a joyous grin. He knew he'd done well. He'd, he had earned top marks in every course, made child's play of every physical try, and proven his loyalty by denouncing the degenerate um, non-straits who had infiltrated the Rodzievsk uh, Officer Academy. Of course, as a good Christian man, he understood the value of humility, but in that moment, Anton Mikhailovich allowed himself to bathe in some well-earned pride, an exemplar of the Russian people. Now, a new Asano Brigade. A special episode in the history of Russo-Japanese cooperation is the history of the Asano Brigade, an anti-red formation of Harbin Youth that served along with the Imperial Japanese Army. Formed under the auspices of the esteemed Kwantung Army officers, the brigade proved itself as a capable force against the Red Partisans, a worthy asset to one of the strongest armies in Asia. Their valour was even compared to those of samurai. The brigade was eventually disbanded, with many of them participating in the struggle against Redism in the Far East, and later joining the... Nice Japanese arms shipments. We need those. Wrong one. Come here. Against Redism in the Far East and later joining the aid, the anti red armies of Russia, including ours, as the matters of security against the resurgent Bolshevik threat became relevant for us both. We can petition the Imperial Japanese Army High Command for the creation of the, of the Second Asano Brigade, which will not only serve the purpose of the common cause between the All Russian Government and the Empire of Japan, but will also will provide us with a reliable veteran group that will aid in our letter in our later campaigns. What's this? Ah, yeah, secure control, please. We'll need that. Your stability really gets hit as Rodzevsky towards the end of the game. Now, arms from the, from the sphere. We will increase Japanese uh, support by a small amount. 750 units of infantry equipment, 250 units of support equipment, 250 units of anti-tank equipment, and 250 units of, of towed artillery. Very nice. Is added to the national stockpile. First opening herself to the world during the Meiji Restoration in the 19th, 18th century, Japan made a long way to become uh, one... Wait. No, 19th century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lucky to become one of the world's leading superpowers and an economic and industrial giant which, which exceeded in every area of production one could imagine. The almighty Zaibatsu titans of the Asian economy produced immeasurable amounts of guns and ammunition, most of which aren't used immediately for the service of the Imperial Japanese army and the adjacent forces in the sphere, but instead are stored until better times. Those tools can be very useful for us, with insufficient arm, arms production in our lands to compensate for the lack of equipment for our forces. We can obtain this, the surplus of Japanese guns and ammo for a handsome price and back up our promises to use them against our common threats, those being border bandits and reds. Now, rethinking our tactics. 233% research bonuses for land doctrine. One of the main reasons that the RFP failed to extend their authority westwards during the initial collapse of the Union was that, quite frankly, most of the tactics and strategies that, were, that we employed were based off of archaic battle plans concocted by decrepit white Russian army officers. Human waves, the supremacy of the officer, grand battle plans, what were they thinking? Those officers and their service to our cause is appreciated, but their specific contributions aren't. It's time that Rodzievsky and his military's high command draft new strategic plans and large unit tactics in order to, be to, in order to best prepare ourselves for the on oncoming conflicts. This way we can ensure that the mistakes made nearly a decade ago won't be repeated. Now, scavenge for loot. And we'll raid Magadan as well. Born the desert, off they go. Good luck, Italy. What? How did you win it so fast? That was ridiculous. They, they must not have had their divisions on the board or something, but fucking hell, that was like... What was that, one... T what? Was that even a da that 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 couldn't have been more than a day? Oh my god, that was that was swift, very swift indeed. Help oh, me do that. Now we've got some nice units out. 
One of them is kind of skint on manpower, but that's, you know, <laughs> not our problem. Farewell, Yugoslavia. Forever in our hearts. Thirty thousand men now. Very nice. Armored cars. Very nice. Five hundred units of armor motorized equipment is added to the national stockpile and spawns a unit of motorized infantry. Decades ago, warfare in Siberia was conducted mostly by armored trains. As technology progressed, so too did weaponry. Armored trains evolved into armored cars, which evolved the trucks used for troop transport and, and logistical support. Now more than ever, we have to take steps in order to secure and integrate new motorized equipment into our armed forces, both in frontline and logistical roles. This will help give an edge to our army's performance and help us out along the road towards a modernized, effective fighting force, especially if we form dedicated mobile units. Surely our friends in Tokyo will be able to secure some surplus equipment for us, even if we do have to pay a premium for them. Strategic mobility at its heart, a central tenet of warfare, is an inherent trait in the Slavic race. Thus, it, can only, it would only be natural that we adapt to this new equipment forward, indeed. Alright, I think we can raid them. I shall pop a save, actually, just in case. What I'm hoping though is that like I don't intend on doing on um on raiding Cheetah. So, uh, certainly um certainly not Cheetah. I might raid Magadan to um before we uh, obviously before we go to war with them. But I'm uh, probably I'm kind of banking on them just submitting the once, and that's kind of how we get our loot from them. And we kind of might might have to leave them alone after that because the chances of us winning aren't particularly high. We're just very um we're very equal in terms of uh troops. That is that is not good when you're on the offensive. Now, give loot. Hey, tribute paid, fantastic. The gamble paid off. Almost at one million people as well. Very nice. We go for after that. Yeah, we'll go black shirt field divisions, then discipline force. And we might run down that. Maybe we should run down that run down this actually. Yeah, I think we will proud Russian industry, yeah. Now let's get new industrial equipment, very nice. Improve relations with the Japanese. All right, nice. New division. Well, hey, now we have 36,000 men. Fantastic. We already have eight divisions. We are absolutely rocking it. How are we doing so well? I've never done this well before in terms of divisions with Rodzewski. Now, oh, Black Shirt Field Divisions. The International Square Black Shirt Field Divisions, which grants for confidence plus 5%. Division recovery rate minus 10%. Damage to garrisons minus 10%. One of the most valuable resources that we have at our disposal are the much feared Black Shirts, the most ideological committed of our party members that form the core of our party's paramilitary. However, until now, we haven't been utilizing the Black Shirts to the best of their abilities. These um, bundle of sticks fanatics, known for their intimid um, intimidatory intim yeah, intimidatory tactics, extreme brutality, and utter dedication to Rodzievsky and the RFP cause have previously been relegated to targeting civilian dissenters and ending internal opposition to the Vosh and his RFP. However, Rodzievsky has a number of ideas for how to better use the Black Shirts, primarily to act as partisan suppression units and political commissars of sorts, instilling them within and alongside our regular, regular units. 
to ensure cohesion and adherence to the party line, both among our soldiers and the civilians that they rule over. Fantastic. We could, we could train more divisions right now, we just need better equipment. Actually, we might try swapping out some of our... Um, we could try... Mm, that'd be wise. Yeah, we could try transferring all of our um, current units into the elite infantry to try and make the best of what we have. Bugado, Asano. Actually, let's let's um, rename them. Let's call them. Um, I believe Bakotnaya is Russian for infantry, and then Strelkovaya is kind of like rifles. Oh, yeah. Bakotnaya Divizia. There we are. Perfect. All of them, with the exception of you, become that. And we need a lot of manpower, but uh, that's to be expected. Ooh, AK-47 is very nice. Let's get that. And we're making progress into our first level, level of infrastructure. Good for you. Actually, I think we should try and get some um, support artillery in our divisions, just to use to um, use the artillery that we current ha currently have in our stockpile. It'd be a shame if we only used artillery from um, the unit. Oh no, we do have support artillery. Okay. Well, it wouldn't hurt to just do this then, would it? I mean, we have the arm. Oh, we're just missing a little bit. That's fine. That's fine. you. And now, Disciplined Force improves army training. What this actually does is um, it, it bumps you up from where was it? Oh, God, where was it? It bumps you up from minimal training to basic training, but it, for some reason it just says improves army training rather than actually telling you what it does. Now, about turn, present arms. No, not like that, you filth. It's precise. It's as if you actually cared about your station here. You can not You can expect to be eating your meal in the barracks prison if you're not careful. Currently, our armed force <coughs> Oh, excuse me. Our armed forces are, curf are a colourful mixing of pot of, cons of conscripted peasants, disaffected white emigres and foreign mercenaries. As it stands, our armed forces are in no position to be fighting prolonged conflicts. Oftentimes, our troops' discipline breaks down, even fighting partisans and bandits. New training regimens must be implemented, disciplinary actions enforced and made harsher, and incentivization schemes put into action to make sure that our troops don't break and run at the slightest indication of adversity. We need to ensure that our soldiers are the best, not just in the Far East, but in all of Russia, to demonstrate our superiority. Fantastic. Now let's get them on the uh, border with uh, Jesus. I like that they all change names. That's good. That's very good. Except for this one. Do we have enough equipment? No. Not even close. I try turning up the music actually. It's kind of low. How many men do you have, Cheetah? If you actually do your full folks, you get you get like sixty thousand men before you move. Now, proud Russian industry. Goro Chumikansky add one military factory and one civilian factory in Amur. Even uh, even since its uprising, the Russian bundle of sticks movement advocated the creation of a truly national industry in a post-red Russia. Actually, now I have to turn it back on, I believe. Uh, 
uh, an independent, self-sufficient industry that doesn't rely on international or any other foreign capital and instead serves the interests of the Russian nation first and foremost, an industry which follows the way of strengthening and recreation of the national economy. The bundle of stick systems abroad traditionally had an old ally and support in small business. While we don't deny their pleas, the demands of our age require us to pay special attention to heavy industry, a key player in supplying our war effort. From a few rust factories in the morrow, Russia will see a rebirth of, a Russian in of the Russian industry that will be directly tied to the interests of the state and the nation. And we can raid Madigan. Uh, Ma I nearly called him Madigan. Magadan. We can raid Magadan. I'm going to change up the colours. I should be doing that more often. The red is nice. The military government in the Gulf. I can't believe Turkey won it so fast. How the hell did they do it? <coughs> well, we aren't getting any recruitable each month. Wow. GDP is literally zero. <laughs> what many men do you have? Fight and conquer? Not yet, it isn't. Oh, yeah, we, yeah, we got the saboteurs. I fucking hate that event. That's fine. You wanna raid me? I'll fucking raid you. We actually have an army right now. Yeah, it's not bad, but it's too dispersed. I improve relations with the Japanese again. National unions. Lag. There we are. <laughs> Guyana. <laughs> Such a big peace deal. Now, we'll pop a save just to make sure. Because, um, like, you know, that's ability hitting the political power loss, you know. It is rough. So, initiate raid. Saboteur strike. We are. Oh, we got another factory. Fantastic. Now, let's get, um, let's get our stuff from Camarova. No, Yakushi, actually. Yakushi. Oh, to make uh, make that stuff, not that stuff. Not very much. I need tank grenades. Saboteur strike. There is an alarming trend growing on our borders. The traders in Magadan seem to have struck a deal with the Zaris and Cheetah and a, t a temporary alliance and alliance even. Um, the mines of Mikhail and or temporary truce and alliance even. The mines of Mikhail and Akovsky are foggy and unclear as ever. This morning, our forward observers have found our border guards dead and their weapons missing. This incident is hardly a tribute paid twice in a row. Bloody hell! The intensifying raids coming from both sides of the, both sides of the border, as well as the destruction of valuable remnants of, of Union roads and rail, have become more and more frequent. Our forces are stretched thin, barely enough to cover one side of the front. When the Tsarists attack, the traders join them, forcing us to expend our resources in two directions. We inevitably lose some of the process, whether it is men, weapons, or plain loot. Radzewski sits in his office, pondering what to do next. This pact has marked a turning point in the relation between the three components of the anti-Bolshevik front. One can only wonder what fate awaits them next. Will the Tsarists and the traders win against the divinely sanctioned Vajd of Russia, or truth triumph? against treachery, only time will tell. And we wait patiently. Oof, rough. Minus 10% base stability. Yeah, look, look at all that destruction. That's most of our industry. Nothing to repair it, because we lost our one factory. And the other one was trading. Now, national unions. Minus 25 physical power, replace illegal trade unions with state control trade unions, plus 2.5% stability, production efficiency cap, plus 2.5% factory output, and dockyard output, minus 2.5%, industrial expertise, monthly change, plus 0 0.5, now let's, uh, get this stuff. 
The degree of control exerted by the state on unions has often been a touchy subject among many senior RFP members. However, it's clear that they do have their uses. They motivate the workers, help our factories follow production quotas, and increase our support among the lower sectors of society. We must take action to ensure that our soldiers of industry not only have their protection, but that their protection is overseen directly by the administration. We will found the Nazionale uh, Comitet uh, Provo Provsoyuzogno Prisverenia, the Union Oversight Committee, which answers directly to Radzevsky. Thus, only unions that receive the personal approval of our beloved Vaj, Radzevsky himself, will be able to operate with um, absolute impunity. This will be done so that they can work closely with the NKPP and the state to ensure the workers' adherence to the party line. Anything else is, is entirely unacceptable as we work towards a strong, unified state for the workers. Yes, it's all for the workers, I assure you. In general, Boggy who's the Argentine government. <laughs> Very funny. Now, the corporate state. Uh, plus 3.5% con uh, uh, construction speed, factory output plus 5%, and factory repair speed plus 50%. Very nice. It is of paramount importance that we begin reorganizing our economy and society as a whole around the tenets of corporatism, that is, the organization of society by groups such as, as, such as agriculture, labor, and military, to name a few. Each one of them representative of their own interests, but ultimately cooperating with one another for the good of a greater Russia. For the farmers are the beating heart of the state, and the laborers toiling for hours and end are Russia's muscles and muscles and sinew. The military, ever vigilant against communists and splitters, are Russia's long arms and stone-like fists. Um, the Vaj will help Russia transcend the confines of a traditional economy and realign herself towards a more efficient corporate entity. Very nice. Now, new agricultural methods. Lovely. I can't believe that Hedrick got selected as successor. Not as rare as Spear, but still. You usually do see Borman. Now secure control. As you can, uh, as you probably noticed, we are saving most of our political power for the regional states, so we can dump it into increases for our societal developments. Better than just one factory here or there. Now, we'll try to get down to uh, Hearts of Darkness. Yeah. Eyes in every home. Gains national spirit, secret police, which grants reconnaissance and encrypt reconnaissance plus ten percent, encryption plus fifteen percent, and decryption plus fifteen percent, and planning speed plus ten percent. The national purification purification doesn't end at the top; it also has to cover the bottoms. To make the population comply with our ideals, targeted repressions and purges are not enough. We need to um, ensure submission and vigilance at every level of Russian society. While the black shirts will continue and intensify their regular activities against the enemies of the nation, the burden of the anti-treason efforts will be imposed not merely on them but also on the patriotic and conscious citizens of Russia who will aid our efforts against the traitors, a neighbour will watch over his neighbour, the children will be encouraged to report on their dissident parents, and our servicemen will be hidden in plain sight, ready to uncover anti-state activities at any given moment. Every aspiring insurgent will find himself surrounded by, uh, by an atmosphere of, of constant terror and persecution, not being able to take a step without fear of retribution. Fantastic. Cock almost got blown up. Now improve relations with the Japanese. Well, can we get something from that? Can we get trucks or artillery or something? Actually, I don't think we can get anything in moderate, can we? Or can we?
lag. Yeah, we can't get anything, get anything in moderate. There's no point to be here. No point of being here. There should be trucks at moderate. There's no reason for artillery pieces and trucks both be high. Oh wow, we actually can get trucks at moderate, but we need naval bases. Fantastic. The Heart of Darkness, we really need this modifier. And, uh... How many men do you have, Cheetah? 23 to 28, and you? Alright, let's raid Magadan. Let's raid Magadan again. Yeah, absolutely. No reason not to keep raiding Magadan. We're gonna be that weak. Prepare a raid against the Free State of Magadan. Fantastic. Now, the Heart of Darkness, change the popularity of, of uh, Hackenkreutz is 5%. Modify the paranoia of the Vosge by Division Organization plus 2.5%. Recruit by Population plus 1%. Recruit by Population Factor plus 1%. Division Recovery Rate plus 2.5%. Disability plus 5%. Award Support plus 5%. And Training Time minus 6.5%. We should probably read this event first. Um, how much time do we have? The all seeing eye. Ah, we'll be fine. We'll read this. We'll uh, read this one first. Roll by roll, man by man, from the top to the bottom, all must be examined. Black shirts, party officials, military officers, cabinet members, all will be given a number and tested. Even those who the Vosh has called friend for years are not free from inspection. The party must be purged of its, of its subversive elements. And, that me, and if it means that Konstantin Radzevsky has to put a bullet in every last traitor's skull himself, by God, he will do it. No stone will be left unturned as every party member's loyalty will be tested. Stand up for Russia, stand up for your nation, look at your brothers and beside you. In them lurks a potential traitor, a Judas to our cause. What do we do to Judas for the betrayers, condemned to an eternity of pain and health? Uh, we too shall condemn them to pain in life. Be ever vigilant and prove your loyalty to the Vajd. Fantastic. Ooh, Japanese arm shipments. Very nice, we need those badly. Yeah. Alright. But alright lads, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing. Shout out to our patron, Ryan McCready. I shall see you down in the comment section of this video, and I shall see you in the next video. But until then, goodbye.